go. All right. So, um, so like I said, everybody, a cloud is basically you are using somebody else's application or service for your own benefit. So that is what AWS Cloud it pretty much uh, is about: is running a network on Amazon infrastructure. So. A, cl a cloud is basically where your network, a portion of your network belongs at other person's data center. Now, if you guys are familiar with uh, uh, IT technology, uh, and I, I believe most of you guys work in IT, um, you probably have seen uh, in infrastructure where a company will rent their data center, which we used to call it a co-location. A um, lot of companies, a lot of places around the globe, uh, US, Canada, India, they have data centers throughout the major metropolitan cities where you will put your own computer or servers and remotely access. Well, that is kind of a cloud service, right? So it's not a new concept. It's been there for a long period of time. A um, lot of company, what they used to do, they used to rent SQL Server, Microsoft BizTalk Server, uh, from a service provider and remotely access it by either uh, SSH or by uh, remote desktop client or some sort of remote application. Before Amazon, the one of the biggest cloud uh, well-known company in North America is called GoDaddy and Microsoft Office 365. Uh, go Voicebootcamp.com is has been hosted at GoDaddy a virtual machine since almost five years now. Uh, before that, it was somewhere else. Even Facebook is considered to be a cloud service. Why? Because you host your pictures on Facebook. You upload your pictures so other people can see. So Facebook is a cloud services. So again, cloud is nothing new. Now, here is Voice Bootcamp Data Center. This is actually a live data center that we have right now, right in front of me. Uh, in my office and this data center uh, is actually co consists of physical machines we have a bunch of physical devices uh, that are laid out in a fully redundant environment uh, with a 10 10 gig network connections we have a blade servers we have a storage whatever and these network infrastructure are physical devices which requires power Right, it requires space, air conditioning because then things get very hot. But the good thing about me is that I live in Canada, so winter time I don't need really heating system in my office. <laughs> so I just keep the data center uh, uh, door open. My entire office is heated properly without uh, paying for extra heating. So this is what a data center looks like now. What Amazon is doing is telling you, you know what, you don't need to invest on this infrastructure because uh, obviously it costs money. Because if I want to upgrade this, I need to spend a lot of money to uh, shut it down, upgrade the components and do whatever I need to do. So for a lot of companies, maintaining a data center like that can be quite expensive because you're not only paying for the equipment, but you're paying for the power you're paying for space, and you're paying, paying for air conditioning. All this can cost money. So what Amazon or most service providers are doing, like Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, uh, Google uh, Cloud, they're saying you run this whole thing at their data center. Uh, Kalindo, try your audio log, uh, uh, check your audio option. Uh, Check a log out and log back in. So, this is where the industry is moving toward. Now, the question is does it mean that every company uh, is going to move to cloud? Probably not, because there are a lot of things uh, uh, you know, you know, to concern about. So, we'll go through some of those uh, concerns as to what type of company might benefit from going to cloud and what kind of companies might not even bother going to cloud at all. Well, I'm one of those. I cannot go 100% cloud. Anyway, so what is AWS service? Now, for those who are new to AWS, AWS is part of Amazon Web Service. They started out as a web service provider. 
all Amazon Web Service was doing back in five years ago or ten, six, seven years ago was hosting a website for you, just like what uh, GoDaddy does or uh, some you know, web hosting company used to do. Then came virtualization. Now, everybody is aware of virtualization technology like VMware. You guys are probably uh, familiar with that. Well, virtualization came out of nowhere and start to take off like there is no tomorrow. Every organization was going toward virtualization technology. And by going to virtualization, in my personal opinion, in my personal opinion, whoever invented the virtualization concept probably deserve a Nobel Prize because not only he benefit he or she uh, uh, who developed it benefiting uh, the environment the uh, the cost of electricity the cost of air running air condition cost of space all these are reduced drastically for an organization just to give you an idea voice bootcamp which is my or small organization we have 32 virtual uh, physical machine that are compute servers that are running in our data center now if I were to on that 32 vir uh, physical machine I have 300 virtual machine running at any given time if if it was not for virtual machine I would have probably have to run close to two to three hundred physical servers I would be bankrupt before I even start my business. So what Amazon thought that Amazon wanted to take over that, take that concept of virtualization and provide you an option to run your servers at their billion dollar infrastructure. All right, well, nice, nice to know that Vemiro, welcome aboard. So Amazon has created an infrastructure based on the virtualization concept where you run multiple operating system on a single hardware by leveraging their market share and by investing billions of dollars in IT resources. So you and I, small to mid-sized company, don't have to invest a lot of hardware and worry about IT support, worry about uh, upgrades and stuff like that but there is a drawback to that because then our job could be in threat as well so there's another bad side uh, of this uh, as well that's why you always have to be diversifying your skill set and second thing that what Amazon did it goes you know what we're not gonna charge you if you're not going to use a system so pay as you go model why is it important for example voice bootcamp we have about 300 virtual machines that are running and our data center has to be running 24 7 because we have students that are logging into our data center practice purposes but there are time 50 percent of the time that the students are not using the data center uh, the labs but i'm still paying for it i'm still paying for the hydro i'm still paying for the space i'm still paying for the equipment in in a way so what Amazon says, you know what, if your server is down, shut down, we're not going to charge you. So you go pay as you go a uh, model. You only pay for what you use. You, the more you use, the more, uh, of course, the more you pay, but it costs you less in a sense, you know, of course, uh, dollar value wise. So AWS resources can be multiple things. So if you want a server you can get that as a resource if you want an email you can get that from AWS if you want storage you can get that from AWS if you want something to run your code like a programming code you can get that service from AWS as well if, if you need a database you can get that from AWS as well so they're adding services every every um, I guess month or whatever now Recently, AWS introduced a very nice application called AWS Connect, which is basically a call center application for small to mid-sized company. And probably next, sometime this month, I'll be doing a seminar on that AWS Connect, and I'll invite you guys to join on that seminar as well. 
Now, the resources which are, which could be servers, you can get computing device, you could get an application engine from AWS to run your code, or simply you could use AWS as a Google Drive to upload your own files and save it as a backup. So benefit of running AWS is that reduce the cost of maintaining your own data center. You do not have to worry about upgrade or patching your servers. Almost zero downtime if you plan it properly and is a pay per use model. So therefore, you only pay for what you use. AWS infrastructure is probably the, probably now the largest cloud service provider in the world. And not only that, if what AWS has done, they have built data centers throughout the world in various countries. For example, they have one huge data center right now in India called Mumbai. Uh, they're adding a couple of more data centers there. They have one in Singapore, Sydney, US, uh, Europe, pretty much in uh, all over the world, except they probably don't have one in Africa yet, but they're currently working on it. So all these services are uh, spread around the, across the world. There are 50 plus data centers that are currently deployed. So they have divided this data center into, into a region called geographic region. So you have U.S. East Coast, U.S. West Coast, Asia Pacific, Europe, China, uh, Canada, uh, South America, and they have a special geographical region called AWS GovCloud. We'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit shortly. Now, the right now, the largest AWS data center or region is called the North Virginia. North Virginia is probably one of the biggest AWS geographic region with six availability zone. I will talk about that shortly as well. Whereas everywhere else, whether it is West Coast, Canada, Asia, Pac, Europe, China, they have at minimum two availability zone for each region for redundancy purposes. For, so you can always have redundancy as well. Welcome aboard, uh, Afridi. Now, what is an availability zone? Availability zone is like a, a, a data center in, you know, what, you have one data center in Toronto and one data center in New York. They're, help, they're backing each other up. So each region has two availability zones. Okay, each region will have two availability zones for high availability purposes. Now, you, but each data center or each uh, zone is isolated physically. That means if something happens to my data center in Toronto, it will not affect the data center in New York. So they are physically isolated from each other. The North Virginia has six availability zone and that each zone are connected to each other using high five, uh, bandwidth fiber. Uh, whatever the fiber technology that they use. So if one zone fail, you can continue to serve the client from a second zone. Now, keep, in one, keep one thing in mind. When you run services in one zone, uh, is one charge, and if you run it in a multiple zone, you'll be paying more. So yes, each region has multiple availability zone, but just because you have it doesn't mean that it is free to use. So you'll pay for it. So again, it come back to the same concept. You pay for what you use. Now, to speed up the process of accessing data, what Amazon have done, Amazon has created over 100 edge location. These are not data center, these are edge location. Location where they have an application running called CloudFront. A cloud front allows you to cache the most static content of your services. For example, if you go to www.voicebootcamp.com website and let's say my server is residing in uh, Toronto and you are accessing my website from Nigeria, from India, from Kuala Lumpur and every time you access what happened? The 
server has to, uh, sorry, your browser will pull the data from my server in Toronto. Now, if my web page does not change that frequently, again, some pages do not change that frequently, then what I could have done, I could use one of the edge location in Africa or in Asia where it will cache my static pages so that whenever you go to the voice bootcamp page next time, it will serve from that location rather than from Toronto. So it increases your performance. And if anybody wants to attack my site, it can prevent some sort of, not prevent, rather reduce the risk of DOS attack, uh, de uh, denial of services attack. So the CloudFront is, an, is a kind of a caching engine that allows you to content delivery network services. Now, the beauty part about Amazon is that everything is web-based management. No software to install, no client to worry about, no Java, no uh, pretty much anything to worry about. It's a pure web-based, um, it has a web-based management, it has a CLI-based management, and it has a custom uh, SDK-based management. We'll go, I'll walk you through some of the web interfaces of AWS so that you can see how easy it is to work on it. Now, what is the architecture of cloud computing? Before I start that, everybody still is able to hear me properly and clear, right? Okay, perfect. Now, when we talk, talk about cloud computing infrastructure, what cloud computing is, it is divided into four different services. You have in, uh, a service called infrastructure as a cloud, uh, infrastructure as service known as IaaS, platform as service, PaaS, PaaS, software as service, SaaS. Now, let's say I want my web server, I want to put my physical server at AWS. That will be known as infrastructure because it's a, it's a server. You could be uh, VBC, EC2, EBS. These are part of infrastructure services. I, I need a web server. I go to Amazon website. I create a new server, virtual machine that is called infrastructure as services. Platform as service are, for example, I want to use a software. I want to use a specific software such as database. I want to use email, uh, not email, but rather I want to use like um, um, a load balancer, a particular service, not the entire server. I want a particular service that is called platform as services, P-A-A-S, meaning um, AWS will manage the so hardware and server for you. All you do is manage, use the software. Then you have software as services, such as web-based email, Office 365, Salesforce. These are uh, server, so software that we use on a regular basis. So they can be, they, they will be categorized as a software as services. Now, they have something else, another service called function as service. These are serverless computing. Serverless computing means that it allows you to build and run application, but without worrying about maintaining a server. Meaning that I would like to create an application, but I don't want to worry about Java. I don't want to worry about CPU, uh, memory, hard drive space. I just, need, I just want to use a computer, put my code in there, let it run, and that's it. That's called function as service. And such functions as services example are storage, uh, simple storage services, Lambda, which is basically an application that allows you to run your code, your Python code, your Java code, JavaScript code, stuff like that. Amazon Dynamic Dynamo Database, which is a relational da uh, database. So if you want a simple database, you could use DynamoDB without worrying about what servers to run it on. If you need a simple notification, you can use Amazon SNS. 
that allows you to send notification services like your server is down, some sort of alarm, whatever notifications that you like. These are serverless computing system. No, you don't have to worry about the server. You don't have to worry about power, uh, you know, environment, anything. You just simply use it, upload your materials, and let it compute. So AWS has a wide variety of services that can be used for computing, storaging functions, databases, analytics, encryption, deployment, and many more. At the end of this session, I will show you one um, very useful, not useful, but rather fun tool that I can think of, which allows you to use Amazon to recognize your face and give you a description about your face, for example. Now, like I said, Amazon is a pay par, uh, pay as you go model. You pay, you, you, you pay for what you use. So let's take a look at some of the example services that Amazon has. AWS storage. What is the storage services? How many people here use Google Drive or OneDrive or Dropbox? Anybody? Some anybody here use any of those services? Okay. So yeah, I use OneDrive. Uh, I use I have I have used Google Dropbox. What I what are they? They're basically a storage area, right? You create they give you a space. You go up there and you uh, upload your music file, you upload your, you know, some people upload softwares, not supposed to. <laughs> All those stuff you upload there and you can easily access them. I use OneDrive a daily basis. I have about one terabyte storage at OneDrive. And I everything that Voice Bootcamp has is actually on OneDrive. And I can access it from anywhere. Well, similar services available from AWS is called Simple Storage Service. It allows you to upload your object. Now, as far as Amazon is concerned, uh, Google Drive, yes, Google Drive is also part, uh, part of the cloud. Simple storage can be pretty much unlimited storage. You can, uh, you can upload unlimited amount of data, but don't expect it to be free though, okay? Uh, they do charge you for uh, uploading. They, 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 no, they don't charge you for uploading, but they will charge you for downloading data. So it can be quite pricey if you're not careful. So do not use simple storage for personal use because you're going to be paying for uh, through the roof. Now, if you need a solution or if your company needs a solution where you want to upload all your most common data, like presentation, or uh, sales materials or brochures, you can just create a S3 object and start uploading the files into that object. And then whenever you need to share it, choose the file, create a link, share the link with the end users. Now, if you want a service where your company want to archive your data, you know, like government records or medical records, you want to archive it for a longer period of time, but you don't usually access that on a regular basis. So in that case, you use a class service called Glacier. Glacier is a service that allows you to archive your data, but you do, you do not want to use Glacier if you're going to access it on a regular basis. That means not everybody can act, uh, public should, uh, will not be able to have access directly on a regular basis. So you only use that for uh, long-term storage. Now, how many, uh, most of uh, most of us have used, I mean, not most of us, everybody's using computers these days. Every computer has a hard drive. Some hard drives are internal, some hard drives are external. And in both cases, you are able to save your or uh, store, store your data. Well, in Amazon, whenever you create a virtual machine, you need to define how many hard drive, how many how much space you need 100 gig 200 gig one terabyte how much hard drive do you need those hard drive in amazon is called elastic block storage ebs which is basically nothing but a hard drive storage now if you need 100 g 100 gb of data uh, space you will create an ebs storage size 100 gb or terabyte whatever the uh, you are able to afford so then you will attach that EBS to, you will attach that EBS to an instance or virtual machine. 
so that you know, that becomes a hard drive for that virtual machine. So we'll talk more about that elastic uh, block storage later. Now, how many people have used things like uh, network file share or uh, uh, SAN, you know, storage uh, storage area network? Most of us who work in IT probably have dealt with that, where you're actually using a hard drive that is remotely access, uh, connected to another device called SAN storage. So this uh, SAN storage called network file share, uh, this SAN storage that you're seeing called EFS is basically allows you to share a storage from another, another server. So what, what you will have is that you will have a bunch of, uh, uh, I guess, EBS right here. And then access that server, uh, access that storage from multiple computers by using network file share, uh, 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 elastic file system. <laughs> well, you could you could definitely connect to it, but if it is basically an interface toward an external uh, that where it allows you to sh uh, share it. Now, I'm not an expert on SharePoint, so I will not be able to give you much uh, data on that. Um, I've never quite honestly why, I never ever use SharePoint even though I have it for free. Um, but that's something that I can find out for you, uh, Freddy, and uh, get back to you on a later date. So the Elastic File System is like a network file share that allows you to share uh, services uh, among multiple instances. Now, Voice Bootcamp, which is my small uh, kingdom, has 20 terabyte storage right available in this data center. I want to access the data uh, from Amazon to this as well. Well, in that case, I can connect my data center to Amazon to transfer data using the storage gateway that allows me uh, allows my employee to access uh, Amazon services, uh, storage services directly from my offices. And then I can do file transfer, whatnot, whatever I, I need to do. Now, if you have large amount of data, like your government organization or medical uh, facility, and you're concerned about transferring data over the internet, what Amazon does, Amazon allows you to, will send you something called Snowball. Snowball is like a, a, an external hard drive. Amazon will prepare that for you, ship it to your organization, you will put all your data into this using, I, I, I guess, from using some sort of interface like could be uh, USB, could be uh, file transfer, or whatever. You upload everything, which is encrypted. You then ship the snowball. I think it's a petabyte. Yeah, this uh, snowball is actually a petabyte storage. You then up secure everything, ship it back to Amazon. And then Amazon will be able to connect that to your AWS storage services to transfer the file. So this is like a high confidential type of company who needs to ensure that their data is secure, like government services, for example. So Snowball will be uh, something that uh, before Amazon send it to your organization, it will have information about your account so that when you say ship it back to them, they know how to extract it to the right Amazon account. Otherwise, you don't want them to store it to someone, someone else Amazon services. Now, what is the advantage of using AWS storage? Hey, if I need one terabyte of storage, what I have to do in a traditionally, I have to go to a, a, a store, I have to buy a hard drive, which is expensive, bring it into my office, shut down my server which will means downtime i have to properly plan it up uh, connect to it transfer data it's a lot of work involved traditionally way if i want to do that in amazon all i have to do create an s3 in a matter of two minutes and i'm done and i'm going to about to show that to you right now so we are going to go to Amazon uh, website. So I'm going to log into Amazon uh, AWS.amazon.com. And 
on the top right corner you will see something called sign in to console and when I'm logged in I'm gonna look I'm gonna search for service called s3 okay so I'm gonna create a service called a bucket I'm going to call this VBC storage simple uh, VBC voice bootcamp storage and I can put a little bit now this bucket name has to be unique not just unique among yourself but unique throughout the entire Amazon so I cannot I, I'm let me start, let me see if I type Canada if it's gonna work or not it may not work but anyway we can try that so I'm gonna choose a region I can choose which country I want to store. Now, again, why you, why is it important to choose a region? If you're in India, you do not want to store this file in US because it's going to, latency is very high. So you want to choose a region for closer to your region so that it increases the performance. So I will choose North Virginia for one simple reason. Although I'm in Canada, North Virginia is the cheapest one. The price in North Virginia for everything is cheaper than any other region around the world. And also, some country like China, you have to use China region because of the government regulation. All right, so I will create uh, a bucket name called Canada. Let's see if it, okay, it says bucket name already exists. Look, I don't have a, I don't have a bucket name Canada. I have only one bucket name called Connect, but nothing in Canada. So how did it how does it say it exists because it's globally so the name has to be unique so chances are that if you have a company name somebody might have already taken it okay so you have to be unique about this so that I'm gonna say VBC is storage chances are that nobody will have that all right click next I, I don't want to uh, go through any of this configuration information but it allows me to customize it I will click next if okay so if you want this hard drive to be accessible from outside world like public then you can modify the public access list I'm not gonna do any of this right now I'm just gonna click next next and that's it I have a, a storage created I didn't have to go drive to the Best Buy or future shop or I don't know um, shop DG to go by hard drive I just simply created one now I can go into that hard drive and I can upload whatever the document I want I can create my folder upload it's easier to upload in our entire folder than it is to um, a individual file and as you are uploading it you do not get charged uh, but the moment you download it you will get charged now, Rushil has a question, Does do you have to pay for that? Of course you do. Of course you do. So let's say I want to upload something, a file. And upload. And you just simply see, you saw uploading is done. Voila. My file is there. And I want to be able to download them. I can click on it and I can click on download. If I want to download now if I want to share this file with you guys okay if I want to share this file with you guys then I will have to uh, change the access list permission and create a link for you give that link to you and then uh, I have the link uh, uh, then you can click on the link to download just like Google Drive and everything now the question is do you get charged for this well Yes, you do. If you do not care, if you're not careful about that, uh, uploading file, anything into Amazon, putting anything into the Amazon, you don't pay for it. But downloading it, you will pay for it, depending on how much they uh, how much they charge you, based on I think the data transfer. Um, however, I believe there are certain uh, free trial available for you guys to practice this on. Now, let me show you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, this is mostly for companies, not for personal use. Okay, so let's say I will go to my billing dashboard.
and you notice that I was being charged 51 cents for what okay so they charged me 51 cents for 50 cents for route 53 that I was using it uh, no charge for creating the as three I think okay right here so free tier because I'm on free tier right now uh, I get to use 20,000 requests so I can you can download 20,000 of them for free and after that I believe you have to pay this this amount something like that whatever it is okay oh again billing is a totally another uh, concept we'll not go through that right now but yeah you will pick you will get charged for it my friend so because of that I'm gonna go and delete it I don't want to pay for someone there for nothing so any anytime you guys are doing this practice uh, for practice I would choose North Virginia it is not uh, yeah it is not too much for a company but when, uh, but it can be if you're not careful about it uh, they are afraid so when I'm trying to delete it, it's going to ask me for VBC storage and then confirm and it will delete that so if you guys are practicing that please 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 whatever whatever you guys do once your test is done delete them right away if you keep them if you're not careful about it it can automatically charge your credit card because it will be associated with your credit card uh, so delete whatever buck uh, things that you are not using now again amazon is for it is for companies not for personal use so um you will be charged for it now as far as how much is it is it too much or less it all depends on perspective right uh look uh, every company is different all right so that's our first uh insight we're gonna take a quick five minute break and then after that we'll talk about the architecture of the cloud environment quick five minute break and then we'll start back with the architecture we'll talk about the instances all right we'll see you soon Thank you. 
Uh, yes, uh, I will be sharing the slide after the sessions with you guys. have everyone back. Freddy, there is no certificate from Voice Bootcamp uh, because certificate you're gonna to have to write exam at Amazon website, uh, Amazon testing center, which is uh, I think a PSI network or something like that that does the exam where you have to write it, uh, or you can go to uh, Pearson View after uh, April 8. Uh, I think April 9 they're starting Amazon exams on Pearson View. Yeah, uh, we are a testing center in Toronto and uh, we got a notification from Pearson that they are going to start the Amazon exams uh, from April 9th. Which is Monday or uh, Tuesday, sorry Tuesday. Alright, is everyone here online? Can you guys hear me? Wow, we have 67 viewers, perfect, loud and clear. All right, so architecture of cloud environment. Now, a cloud, basically a network owned by the service provider. That service provider could be your ISP, it could be your Amazon, it could be Google, could be Microsoft, could be whoever. It could be even you or me. I could, I literally can provide cloud services if I want to, to my client, but nobody's going to buy it from me anyway. <laughs> all right. So what is a cloud? So first of all, a data center is basically a network with a bunch of servers and network devices that are running together, providing services. So here you got a data center with a bunch of ser uh, servers sitting on top of each other, providing services. In a traditional way, used to have one server with one operating system. For example, if I have one particular server, I could run only Windows 2K, or I could run um, um, uh, Linux server or Unix server, for, for example. Well, if I have multiple applications that requires multiple operating system, so uh, that means that I will have to get that many number of servers with that many operating system which can be quite expensive and sometimes daunting task. What industry, uh, what the technology was invented to resolve that issue was called virtualization. What virtualization does, it allows you to take one physical server and allows you to run multiple operating systems simultaneously. That is called virtualization. You could run Windows, Linux, Unix, all at the same time in the same hardware by using a virtualization layer. That virtualization was, uh, take, uh, well, Amazon took advantage of that and created an infrastructure where you get to use the virtualization on demand and self-service manner. And at the same time, 
gives you the ability to increase or decrease your uses called elasticity so one of the biggest advantage of uh, cloud architecture from amazon is that first of all it is on demand meaning three in the morning if you decided that you forgot to create you need to create a web server you could do that you don't need to go to the uh, uh, call your vendor and order a new server simply wake up three in the morning make a coffee and while you're making a coffee you could have created a virtual machine while your coffee is still being pure poured on your cup cup easy uh, easy busy as any anybody pretty much can do that elect elasticity meaning that if i want to if suddenly i realize that i need to increase my memory on my hard drive I could work again do the same thing wake up three in the morning pure start a coffee and add a memory without even any downtime i could easily do that the option of elasticity to achieve that give me gives gives me the ability to increase and decrease on the fly and i only get to use pay for what i use now a virtualization is a software that runs on, such as VMware that runs on top of your infrastructure uh, physical machine and, and then provides you the ability to create multiple operating system now here's the example of an HP blade server and you notice this is the blade server each one of these square boxes that you see these are called these are physical server I have one I have two of them and so total I have 32 virtual uh, physical server but on each of this uh, physical server as you can see represented by a unique IP address is running multiple is running multiple uh, virtual machine and if you take a look at right here I got a Cisco router running here which is a Linux I have call manager running here which is also Linux and I have multiple other virtual machines that are running here, Windows, Windows 7, uh, the Candidate PC1 and Candidate PC2, for example, are Windows uh, 7 or 8 running on the same hardware. So by leveraging the virtual machine, I get to utilize the same physical, uh, so sorry, the leveraging the vir VMware, I can use the, utilize the same hardware for multiple operating system. This is what the virtual machine is doing. Now, what are the virtual machines that we have available? We have VMware, we have KVM, we have Zen, and we have VirtualBox. And then of course we have Microsoft Hypervisor, but I don't pay much attention to that anyway. VMware, which is one of the biggest virtual machine uh, platform right now, um, commercially it is one of the most uh, well-known and of course quite expensive as well then they, then you have something open source virtual machine KV, KVM and Zen um, Amazon I believe is using both uh, Zen and KVM right now Amazon is using both of this I think they're moving to KVM but I'm not 100% sure uh, but then then you of course you have virtual box which is I believe owned on uh, managed by Oracle right now So these are the type of virtual machines that you have available Zen and KBM are open source. So they're basically free Now if you're using a VMware you would create a virtual machine by right clicking on your host and then follow the instructions You, you do the exactly the same thing on Amazon website you want to create a VMware, you create an instance, and you follow the instructions. It's as easy as it is. The major difference, this is an internal system. This is probably hosted in the cloud. Now, management of uh, AWS can be managed by uh, the web interface, AWS um, Management Console. You have CLI management where you can run commands, pro, command prompt management services. You can also develop your own web interface to customize, create a custom management interface to manage your uh, platform using SDK. Now, some of you guys might be a programmer and if you have a better idea that you know what, 
I don't like the AWS web interface. I'm going to get someone from India or Pakistan to create a very nice web interface and I'm going to sell that as a service. Well, no problem. You can use SDK. So you can create your own management tool and sell it as a service and Amazon wouldn't even care about it because it gives you the ability to do that. So the benefit of using my uh, AWS Management Console is easy to navigate, usability, and conveniently have mobile app as well. So I can create an instance while I'm in a plane. Actually, I've done that just for the test of, test of it. Uh, you can also run programming uh, if you are someone who coming from Linux background you could be running command line instruction and manage your system you can create instance from CLI you can uh, add network from CLI you can pretty much do as many as anything you, uh, that you can imagine it allows you to write scripts and execute the scripts in a batch file and then of course software development kit allows you to develop your own inter uh, interface that can be used to manage the AWS account. So this is what a uh, Amazon uh, management tool looks like. And they're categorized as you can see. If you want something to do with the game, go to the gaming category. If you want to develop something related to mobile, go to mobile category. If you want something analytical, go to analytical categories for example. CLI, which allows you to execute command from Linux, Mac OS, or Unix. It allows you to use a Windows PowerShell or command processor. Also, you can run commands on Amazon Instance remotely using SSH or as well as EC System Manager. SDK, so if you're a developer and you're thinking about creating your own web interface, you get to choose any of this programming language of your choice to develop your web based interfaces or whatever the custom functions that you want to create on that is web based. You run those on this command and then you execute this command on Lambda or your own application engine. All right, so that's the web interface. That's how you manage the platform. But what are the core services? AWS Practitioner is all about learning the terminology. Uh, make sure you know what EC means. Make sure you know what EBS means. Make sure you know what service to use when. Not practical, but mostly um, understanding about the component. So here we're going to talk about EC2, EBS, S3, uh, Global info, we're talking about the global infrastructure, VPC, and security group. EC2 is your virtual machine, is your server. So if I want a web server, I will create one EC2. If I want two web server, I will create two EC2. So in your in your account, you could create up to thousands of instances in a matter of a couple of minutes. You pay for what you use and each EC2 will be virtual server. You don't really need to know what kind of VMware infrastructure they're running or virtualization infrastructure they're running. All you need to know that you need a virtual server and then you, need, you get to decide. Do you want Windows? Do you want Linux? Do you want custom image? Or do you want Unix system? And then you have an option to add more instance or downgrade instance by using something called auto scaling. Now imagine you are maintaining you're maintaining a server. Okay. You have a, a server that runs a database and suddenly you realize you're running out of memory. What do you do? What is uh, some of the steps that you guys do when you need to add a memory to your physical server? You need to first of all buy the memory, shut down the server, which is a downtime. May, you may have to go through an ITIL process of going through the entire management. It might take three days to shut down a server and then sh do, shut it down, up, put the memory in and then reboot the server. Now you have more memory or CPU, whatever it is that you want to increase. Well, what if you don't need it again? Well, nothing, you just leave it there, right? 
Well, if you do not need it, you have the in Amazon, you have the options to remove it without even worrying about it. So auto scaling monitors the health of your server instance. And you can put a little bit of a, a trigger saying if the CPU increased by 80%, add another instance of it. So it can instance. So this by upgrading the memory physically, we call that vertical upgrade or vertical scaling. But upgrading by adding more instance, as you can see, it's like horizontal upgrading uh, or scaling. So in this way, you could add instance as you want, depending on the resources that you need without having to worry about it. Now, here's a good thing about this. So let's say you're running a promo, you're running a virtual machine, right? Suddenly you realize that you're, you introduce a new program or you introduce a new service. Suddenly you realize your traffic is increasing. And your server cannot handle the load. So uh, you might be running a promotion, for example, for five days. And that during that five days, you saw the traffic is spiking. Uh, a perfect example would be Cisco Live or uh, Jitax in Middle East. During that five days, you could add instance as many times you want, five of them just to serve the customers and pay for those five days. And after five days, it can scale down back to zero, or, sorry, back to one. So that means you don't have to keep paying for rest of the month or years or whatever. That is the beauty about these, uh, these services, virtual machines. So yes, AWS allows you to increase, but also allows you to decrease when you're not using the services. Now, elastic block storage, EBS, which is your hard drive. There are two types of EBS you have, HDD, which is cheaper, and then SSD, which is a bit more expensive, higher solid state. In both cases, they are persistence. That means if you shut down your server, reboot it, and up, uh, start again, your data is still there. It's called persistence. However, if you delete your instance and recreate it, then you lose your data. Keep that in mind. When you create a block of storage, you attach that storage to a instance, just like how you attach a hard drive to a computer. And then you have the option to replicate that data in the same availability zone without paying for any fee. You can back up using taking a snapshot. You know how you take a VMware snapshot? If you're gonna use a snapshot, it's gonna cost you more. If you remove the option of snapshot, it will cost you less. You can encrypt the data transport as well. And it allows you to increase the volume on the fly. So if I need one terabyte tomorrow, I can increase it without having to buy a new hard drive. Well, of course you're gonna pay for it. So here's the instance that I'm gonna create and every instance must be associated, sorry, every storage must be associated with the instance. And it tells me which availability zone it is it's there and when, whether it is running or stop. And as you notice, you got one service that stop. Whatever is stop, no charge. Whatever is running, you will be charged. Uh, we talked about the Amazon S3, which is your uh, storage service, allows you to store unlimited number of object, access anytime from anywhere, and provide rich security control. Global infrastructure, we already talked about that. Region, we talked about that. Availability zone, okay, so repeating slide. All right. You guys can still hear me okay, right? Now, one of the first thing that you do when you log into Amazon is that you create a virtual private network. Okay, you create a virtual private network. So, before well, there's only there's already one there as part of default. Uh, that's already part of default. It's called um, VPC, Virtual Private Cloud. A virtual private network in Amazon is your own space. 
you get to do whatever you want in that space. Nobody else get access to it. By default, all access to VPC in and out is automatically blocked. You can only work, you can only access it between your um, services. In order to get access to the VPC, you gotta tweak the security a little bit. So whenever you create a virtual private network cloud, is the same concept as on-premise networking. It allows you to control, it gives you full control of your network configuration. You can isolate the VPC if you want to, or you can give partial access to VPC if you need to. There are several layers of security, which ability to allow and deny specific internet and internal traffic. Within that VPC, you can run all these services that you get to use. So whenever you want to add services, you have to define which VPC that that service should be accessible. Voice Bootcamp has two VPC. We have the production one for our corporate, for our you know internet traffic, and we have an internal one for lab traffic. So we always put whatever testing that we do, we always use the lab-based VPC because nobody can ha nobody has direct access to that. Now each v uh, feature of VPC or virtual private cloud is that it allows you to choose multiple availability zone so that if the VPC in North Virginia goes down, the same VPC will be accessible from India, for example. So I get to choose multiple region, uh, sorry, multiple availability zone. I can create subnet, which can divide the VPC into multiple different network. And then I can create a routing between them. I can say that within, that, within my lab VPC, pod one subnet cannot access pod two, but pod 10 can access everybody else. So I have that capability options as well. If I want traffic to go to internet, then I will use internet gateway. If I want NAT, you know, because of your private IP address going toward public, I will use the NAT gateway. If I want to control what goes out and what comes in, I will use network access control list, like an access list. Now here's an example of a VPC. So I'm creating a VPC called test VPC with the subnet 10.0.0.0 slash 16. And then this VPC is on, available on US West Coast Oregon uh, region. Now, within that VPC, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create two subnet, subnet A with this IP block, which is under, which is subset of this. And then I'm going to create a second subnet, subnet B with a different block IP address. It's still subnet, subset of this. <coughs> So now I could create a routing between them so I can transfer tra traffic from subnet A and subnet B by doing routing, but I cannot send traffic from either, either of these subnet to internet. To be able to do that, I must put an internet gateway. Now when I am connecting an internet gateway, I'm only allowing traffic from this subnet, but not from the subnet B. No traffic out from that subnet is allowed. So I have full control of that if I want to. So just like a typical network, right? You need to allow traffic. Now, obviously, to send the traffic out from in, inside to outside, you're going to have to do netting. And then as the traffic goes outside or coming inside, you need to create an access list. So that's where the security group comes into play. In Amazon, security is one of the most highest priority. Why? Because you got thousands of clients around the globe using and sharing the same resource. If I'm a bank and I am uploading my information onto the Amazon and you are one of the company as well, what if your network was compromised for whatever reason, security was compromised? What is their guarantee that that, that did not affect all the other people around that same infrastructure or platform? So that is one thing that Amazon has to give the company an assurance that one compromised area should not affect everybody else. So security is one of the highest priority for Amazon. 
and it does so by creating an inbuilt-in firewall and by creating an access control list who gets in and who gets out so when I have a corporate security I could create different group for different type of application I can create a web group I can create an application group I can create a database group and then in each group I decide what type of protocols are allowed inbound or outbound so I can enable certain port and I can disable certain port so to create an instance one of the things that you want to do is go to your instance sorry to create a security group profile you want to select the instance and then go to the security group settings on the left bottom area and that allows you to create a security group if I create a new security group I get to choose the name and which VPC this security group is for okay which VPC this security is for so what we're going to do you can choose the lab one you can choose the production one and then create an inbound and outbound uh, list AWS practitioner uh, is mostly for people to get familiar with AWS components and being able to offer uh, solutions to uh, you know um, your customers a basic idea what components are available and what they're used for but if you're a person who are designing it or responsible for designing AWS then you got to go to the next which is called AWS solution architect now here under inbound and outbound I get to choose my list as an outbound what traffic is allowed what protocols are allowed so this is where I will control inbound and outbound information I can do the same thing for inbound traffic that traffic allows from anybody as long as it is on port number 80 that means web traffic is allowed for inbound communication all right now remember the pro earlier I said that you, you can you get to choose multiple instance well what if I have a web server with a multiple instance created but how does the call uh, traffic goes to the right instance well we're going to use a load balancer in Amazon they allows you to use a load balancer to distribute the traffic to multiple site so I could die I could type something like www.cisco.com and that traffic will come into the load balancer from there it will go to one of this server so that is one of the things that you want to do is distribute your traffic if you are a very big organization now load balancer allows you to what it does it checks the health of each instance if an instance is suffering because of high CPU it can take that instance out of the target and then when it comes down you can put it back into the service so that is one capability of the L uh, ELB uh, uh, elastic load balancer now you can add sorry something called oh so the load balancer can support multiple protocol so I could support multiple protocol like HTTP database whatever TCP IP protocols most commonly used you could uh, use to put a, a metric say okay keep watching the load balancer for certain thrust hole if certain instance uh, you know memory spike do something or uh, if a CPU spike do something that is called cloud watch metrics access log you can look at the log file you can do a health check of your instance and one of the thing that it can do one of the thing that it can do is that it can decide where to send traffic to if one of the instances is busy it can support IPv6 it can support dynamic port and it can delete and protect request tracings load balancer 
as the traffic comes in here, it can choose different instance based on different port for the same traffic. So I could be dialing some www.voicebootcamp.com. It will come to port 80 onto the load balancer. But from the load balancer, it can go to ap application 1 on port 80, application 2 on port 8080, on application server 3 on port 3306 for whatever reason. So as a customer, I will not have to remember which port to use for which server. All I have to say, go to www.voicebootcamp.com. It will come to the load balancer IP address, not the ins not this IP address, not this, but the load balancer IP, and then load balancer will send the traffic to the respective target. So to do that, I must first create a target group. So this is a target group. And in that target group, you got targets. These are targets. Okay, these are targets. And then I need to listen. So these listeners right here. So these are the three things, listeners, target, and target group. Listener is a process that checks for connection requests. So one of the listener on this load balancer is going to be HTTP, is listening for HTTP traffic. If you want to listen for Microsoft SQL Server their, their, uh, traffic, you will enable the port 1433. Therefore, 1433 becomes the listener as well. Target is the server IP address that's going to serve the call or request. And target group is a group of target working together. So here's an example. I am listening for certain port. Whether it, is, whether it is HTTP, SFTP, TFTP, whatever, doesn't matter. And then I'm going to send the traffic to, I got two different group, target group, in organized differently. So I can create a target group called India, and I put the two serve uh, instance in India, and I will have another target group called USA, and put all the servers in USA. And then use the listener to point the traffic to whichever direction I want. So the load balancer can be accessed by going to the instance dashboard and go to the load balancer and just keep following the instructions as part as uh, configuring load balancer is concerned. Again, this course or seminar is not about full detail configuration. It's to give you overview about the product, certifications, and what are the components and what they do so that you get to make a wise decision in, when you're proposing a solution to a customer. Auto scaling is the most important node or component within AWS. Auto scaling allows you to increase your server resource dynamically by adding instance or removing instance. So, so here's an example when web server one in availability zone increase its CPU by 80%. I can use an auto scaler to say, you know what, create a second web instance in a different availability zone with a different subnet so that it can, it can provide the load balancing or uh, yeah, load balancing mostly. Now somebody has to keep monitoring that, right? Somebody has to keep monitoring that. Like when does the CPU increase? The job of the person in the uh, component that is responsible for monitoring that is called the cloud watch. So cloud watch is a component that is mostly used for health check, monitoring, support, stuff like that. So you will use the cloud watch to say, you know what, if this guy's CPU reach 80% or greater than 80%, then add instance, keep adding instance. So you need to define what is your most busiest hour and in auto scale uh, in auto scaling you can configure such that during the peak hour you want to increase your instance by one or two or during the slow hour you may want to decrease your instance by one or two for example.
So that falls into your capacity planning and you should know when is your most capa uh, used capacity during the day or when is unused capacity during the day. So the basic, why do you add instance? Uh, let's say you run out of space or run out of CPU power, you need to add more server. So you just create an instance which automatically uh, add more power to your resources. So you can serve your website form using multiple computers or database or whatever it is. So auto scaling group, which is basic configuration, uh, allows you, to, uh, of course, you configure the parameters and then you can say scale out or scale in. Scale out means add instance. Scale in means remove instance, terminate an instance. And the moment you scale out, the moment you scale out, you're gonna get, you're gonna get billed for it. You're gonna be charged for it. But the moment you terminate instance or scale in, you're not gonna you're no longer going to be charged for that. So the chances are that you only get billed for the duration the instance has been running. So three components that are required to focus on is launching launch configuration, like what do you want to launch? Uh, Uh, this guy is supposed to be run until 12 o'clock. So it's basically almost three to three hours uh, seminars. Uh, so launch configuration. So probably another hour or so. Uh, launch configuration is to decide what do you want to uh, launch. So you can to decide the a AMI is a kind of the image you want to run. Amazon uh, machine image uh, instance type. You get to choose a security group and the roles. Then go to auto scaling group, which VPC you want to run, what subnet, what load balancer, minimum instance you want to remove or add, maximum instance you want to add, desired capacity, the space, you need to define that. Then auto scaling policy. When do you want to execute? Uh, on demand or certain time of the day or scale out policy, like how many instances do you want to add out? How many scales, how many instances do you want to terminate at once? Stuff like that. If you want to dynamically do this, you could use a CloudWatch. A CloudWatch will monitor the instance, uh, sorry, uh, Elastic Load Balancer can send a trigger to the CloudWatch saying, hey, I'm running out of CPU on instance number two. I'm running out of CPU on instance number two. CloudWatch can send a trigger to the auto scaling say please add an instance and it will add another instance for you okay so you need to you need to learn how to configure these all options so that you can dynamically uh, add and remove uh, services uh, keep one thing in mind though you do not want to uh, go crazy uh, just because you have the option because you're going to get billed for that so here's an example where in the cloud watch i can say the cpu utilization is greater than 80 percent in a consecutive period, generate an alarm, auto scale from this security group, add two instance. You have the choice to add two instance or one instance, it's up to you. All right. Now, we all heard about DNS, correct? Domain name server that we type www.voicebootcamp.com or cisco.com, vmware.com. Well, it's, that name is served by DNS server and in, in uh, AWS, root 53 is your DNS server. So all it, all it does is DNS. So I'll show you an example of root 53. So I'm on my Amazon console and I will search for root 53, which is DNS uh, server. And there, I can simply add, uh, by the way, uh, Amazon will charge you $12 for domain name. So if you uh, be careful, if you want to do a, a Route 53 lab, you may not be able to test 100% unless you buy a domain. So just to give you a warning. So here, you notice that in the DNS, I have one hosted zone. 
I have a zone called 02engineer.com. So I create a zone called 02engineer.com. Uh, this is my domain name. And when I click on that domain name, it will have one record that says www.02engineer.com pointing to this IP address. Okay. That IP address, I believe, does not. Uh, I think it exists. Yeah, it's my user blog. It still exists. Okay. Uh, okay. So, using this root, if so, if uh, approximately an hour. Um, so this. Uh, um, DNS can be used for your, um, you know, if you want to manage your own DNS server. Now, I think every time you create a DNS entry, it costs you 50 cents, and then uh, whatever the domain that you want to use, uh, uh, you will be paying for that uh, domain name. So, again, we won't go too much onto the DNS part right now. Database Amazon can provide database. There are multiple database servers you have. Amazon has their own relational database server, which allows you to run uh, Amazon Aurora, which is quite a quite big uh, database server. You can run Oracle, Microsoft SQL, you can run Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, Amazon has their own database serverless database called DynamoDB, which allows you to create your own database without you to worry about what operating system. Now, if you're going to use Microsoft SQL Server, you may need to upload in, have an operating system windows you have to worry about the memory and cpu all those stuff but if you use dynamo Debo, uh, db you don't have to worry about any of that uh, amazon has something called redshift which is for data warehousing elastic cache sorry there's a spelling issue allows you to create database cache uh, database migration tool if you want to migrate database for your data co-locate your data center into amazon and then they have something called neptune which is for graph database engine again i won't go into database uh, details of database because this is not a database course so let's say i want to copy the data from my office my my own data center voice bootcamp data center from oracle into amazon aurora i could use data migration tool which allows me to transfer data from my office to the Amazon cloud. Lambda. Lambda is a fully managed serverless computer which allows you to execute your own scripts. So Lambda is more like um, you, you, you develop your code and you upload the code to Lambda and it will execute it for you. And whatever the, your code does is going to be the result. You don't have to worry about the managing the code uh, SDK or the version or anything. The Lambda will does it for, for you. You could write a code that trigger an alarm. You could write a code to create an instance, whatever that you can think of. Uh, Lambda, for example, you could upload a code into from your mobile app into the Lambda and Lambda will execute it and send you the result back to you. Uh, an example would be you can take a picture from your, uh, you can take a picture from let's say uh, you're, you're traveling Paris and you take a picture, you upload that picture to Bucket, your S3, and then dump that information to the Lambda code and Lambda will then recognize that you execute something called recognition application analyze the picture and send your report back to your mobile saying okay this picture was taken in france there are five people in that picture it was a daylight some of the people are smiling whatever it will do all those analysis for you elastic beanstalk uh, elastic beanstalk allows you to use the auto scale and elastic load balance to scale and provide a man, a manage your workload. It provides a tool in a form of Amazon CloudWatch to monitor the health of your deployed application. It also provides the capacity to provision due to its rel reliance on S3 and EC2 instances. So if you really need a service that does 
that looks at the auto scaling and uh, load balancer you know to uh, work uh, to create a dynamic scaling you want to use elastic bin stock simple notification service sns which is highly available durable uh, secure notification service like a text you can send an sms to your uh, phone you can send an sms to your uh, email or whatever the services that you want is basically a so, uh, notification services okay let's say you're building your cloud infrastructure okay so you have 20 servers to install uh, or create do you want to create them manually no what do you do you create a csp text file with all the information based on certain format and then upload the text file like, like a batch uh, into cloud formation and it will create the amazon infrastructure for you so cloud formation is like a batch file that execute a, a based on a text file with all the information you supply cloud watch is a monitoring device that triggers application and allows you to check the health of your amazon services cloud front we talked about that cache engine which serves your static pages more efficiently from a security perspective AWS has quite a bit of security services. You have AWS Artifact, which provides uh, uh, a service that checks to make sure that you, your security and documents are in compliance. Every country has their own regula regulation. So you can use the Artifact to say, you know what, if you're in China, then whenever you are creating an instance, make sure that you use Chinese region. Do not use US region. They don't like that. So Artifact will allow you to follow that uh, uh, compliance. AWS Certificate Manager, which is used to create SSL certificates. Uh, by the way, all SSL certificates that you create in AWS are free of charge. They are completely free. You don't have to pay for it. Amazon Cloud Directory, which is your directory LDAP server. Not a Microsoft LDAP, but general LDAP server allows you to create multiple LDAP services. AWS directory service is your active directory. So if you just need a Microsoft active directory, but you do not want to buy Windows server or install it by yourself or manage it, you just get a AWS active directory, which is a fully managed active directory service in AWS cloud. If you're concerned about hard, uh, hardware security, then you use AWS Cloud HSM, Hardware Security Modules, which gives you extra layer of, uh, extra layer of security. Guys, you don't have to learn how to configure this right now. All you need to know what they are used for, just a high level. Amazon Cognito, which is a simple user identity and manage data synchronizing services that helps you securely manage and synchronize application data for your users across mobile devices so it's mostly used for mobile devices to synchronize data and applications aws identity and access management uh, this is for managing user accounts you know if i want to give you guys a different privilege so that i get to give the admin privilege but I create multiple accounts with the lower privileges, uh, then I would use the AWIM uh, for that. AWS organization is like, kind of like a policy-based you know, domain, like Voice Bootcamp is an organization. So everything you do under that organization. Amazon Inspector is an automated security assessment service that can help you identify your vulnerability. So it's like a kind of a, a running a scan on your network to see if there is any port open that should not supposed to be. Maybe the passwords are weak, stuff like that. Amazon key management service. This is to, this is to manage your encryption keys. So if you're going to deal with encryption, you're going to use a key management services. 
AWS Shield, which is to protect against DOS attack, like a, a IDS sensor. So AWS Shield is a protect against DOS attack. Web application firewall is a firewall for your websites. So protect against, uh, you know, like SQL queries or uh, those URL uh, DOS attack. Uh, it will protect against those type of attacks. If you're a developer who loves to develop or wants to develop, then you would you use the developer tool such as Cloud9. Cloud9, Cloud9 was actually a third party organization that Amazon actually acquired. It allows you to create, it basically gives you an online tool to develop your code or application or IDE we call it. Integrated Development Environment, which allows you to create your own application. AWS CodeStar, cloud service for creating, managing, and working with your software development. Uh, it allows you to deploy, uh, quickly de develop, build, or uh, deploy application on AWS. If you develop a code and you need to debug it, you will use the X-Ray. X-Ray allows you to debug your code before they go into production. AWS Code Commit. Code Commit is like a source code man, uh, virtual uh, version control, like a Microsoft Visual Source, which allows you to manage your, you know, all the modification that you do the code and it keeps a version uh, capability. Uh, sorry, version, uh, uh, different versions. So you would use the Code Commit for that. Code Pipe. Uh, web is an Amazon web service that product that automate the software development process allowing developer to quickly model visualize and deliver a code for new features so you would want to use a code pipe for that if you are building your own application you could use a code build which is a follow um, fully managed uh, continuous integrated service that allows you to compile your own source code run test and then package the software into executable format and then of course provisioning it if you're someone with the media we're almost there very close to that if you are someone in the media then you could use media uh, utility uh, for example element and media convert you can use the media convert to uh, which is a file-based video transcoding service. It takes a video file and it broadcasts it to the other person, uh, to the other people for deliveries. You can take any uh, audio file and you can stream it to the customers. If you have a live show going on and you want to connect to a TV, so you could use a media live to broadcast live video and deliver that broadcast to televisions or internet connecting to multiple devices like TV or screen or projector or whatever that you want. So that's like a, a you know, live Facebook concept. Media package, uh, element media package, which allows you to prepare, protect your video for delivery over the internet. It ta you take a single video input Pack, uh, create a video stream and then play it to multiple different type of interfaces. Media store, it's for your video file storage. You can upload all your video files uh, online and stream it from there. Media tailor, media tailor is like you're watching a live video or recorded video but you want to put a little bit of ads, advertisement. Then you would use the media tailor to put advertisement in a video that is being played to the user, so that you know you get you get to make some money. Uh, Amazon Kinesis, which is video streaming from connected device through an Amazon cloud for for a machine language. So, uh, an example would be if you ever go to China, you will see that as the moment you get out of the airport or whatever, they have cameras everywhere. And what it does, it takes your uh, picture and analyze it and then match, match it against a machine language to see if you are a wanted person or not. So 
Amazon can assess will be something like that to work on uh, applications related to that type of environment. If you're developing mobile application, then you would use the mobile hub, uh, which is a collection of uh, tools designed to develop, test, configure application for your mobiles. Uh, device Farm, which is testing application service, lets you test, interact with your Android, uh, with your Android or iOS profile. So you would use the uh, Device Farm for that. If you're synchronizing your application with your mobile service, you use the App Serve App Sync. Uh, we talked about the data migration. Uh, which allows you to database migration from an older, older device into uh, your, your data center. You have something called Server Migration Service, SMS, uh, agentless service that allows you to migrate thousands of on-premise workload to an AWS. So this is allows you to migrate from your internal data center to the AWS server. We talked about the Snowball, which is a petabyte data transport solution. All right, we're, all, we're pretty much done with the core services. We're gonna take a quick five minute break and then we're gonna talk about the business side of it and then billing side of it. And then we should be, we should be almost done. So let's take a quick five minute break and then we will continue. We're almost done, so a little bit more. A few more slides and we're, we will finish it up. I do appreciate your patience and sorry for dragging it a little longer. Uh, I, I'm just trying to finish everything today so that we don't have to come, uh, come online tomorrow. So everyone is back. We've got 70 people joining from worldwide. That's a pretty good crowd. Do we have everyone back online? Can you hear me? Perfect. Well. All right, last few slides to make sure that uh, um, I'll, sh I'll sh um, share my, is it enough information passing the exam? Um, I would say it gives you enough to understand everything, but uh, to pass the exam, I'll show you a link where you can go to finish off so that make sure you can get a better understanding. I will share you the slide and the video so that you can continue to repeat the lectures so that you get better understanding uh, and knowledge about the component. Uh, but a little bit more study from Amazon website itself it will help you pass the exam for sure. All right. Now, if you are, if you need a solution for business, if if you are, if you need a solution for business, then you would um, go to the Amazon uh, doc. Um, Amazon has a work doc which allows you to create something similar to Microsoft Office uh, 365. It gives you email. Chime is a web conferencing, real time. Workspace is like uh, if you want to, let's, let's say you want to uh, create, you want to give people Windows XP or Windows 8 or Linux desktop, you use Amazon Workspace. You create a workspace and then you install Windows XP on it or Windows 7 on it so that you can access your desktop from anywhere in the world by using a web browser. So that is a very, very neat tool. If you want to set up a web conference, you will use a Chime, which is quite expensive, trust me. I've, I looked at it yesterday to use a Chime to do this seminar. I was going to go broke. Amazon App Stream, uh, which is allows you to stream your um, streaming service, gives the user with the instance access to their desktop application from anywhere in the world. So these are some of the business-related applications that you need to uh, get familiar with if you're going to provide services to a company. Now, Internet of Things, IoT, you heard about that a lot. What is it? IoT is a platform that enables you to connect a device to AWS service and run services from uh, run services from the device remotely or online. 
So you can buy a service like Raspberry Pi, you know, and then you can connect the Raspberry Pi to Amazon operating system online. Amazon has something called free RTOS, which is operating system for microcontroller that makes a small low power edge device easy to program, deploy and secure connections. So you could use Amazon operating system on a devices like this. Green Grass, which is a service that extend the Amazon functionality to the IoT. So if you're familiar with IoT or working with IoT Internet of Things, then you would be using these three components. Now comes to billing. In Amazon, which basically is a model that goes pay as you go, pay less as we uh, if you reserve the service we'll talk about pay less per unit by using more and pay less as Amazon grows now the good thing about Amazon is that you pay for what you use and when you if you if you're gonna let's say uh, for me to host voice bootcamp website at GoDaddy I, I have to pay GoDaddy $60 a month now whether my website is down or shut down or running doesn't matter I have to pay them $60 a month now which is not a big deal by the way with a pay as a go model if I shut down the, my website I will not pay pay for it if I run it for 15 days out of 30 days I will only pay for 15 days so that's a good thing so no long-term contract no licensing required I don't have to pay for Windows license software license nothing Pay less when you reserve. I will get seven up to 75% discount if I decide to buy in lump sum. So let's say I go to Amazon, I say, you know what? I want to host, I want to, I want a website where I will pay for it monthly in, in advance. So they might give me a, a website that's supposed to be cost $50 a month. If I go pay as you go, I might get it for $30 if I pay upfront. So I get a discount, volume discount. Pay less by using more. The more I use, the less I will pay per minute, per second or whatever, but my bill will be longer to be honest with you because I'm paying for more, more services. I'm just, pay, I'm just getting a volume discount, that's all. Now, because Amazon is getting competition from Google, Microsoft Azure is picking up. I think their Microsoft Azure is right now second in line. Amazon has changed their price 44 times to stay competitive and they continue to change their time prices so basically what they're saying as Amazon grow they will reduce the prices for you now the cost cost will depend on many factor um, there is no cost for inbound data transfer that means anything I upload to Amazon no cost for it if I transfer data from one server to another server in the same availability zone, no, uh, same region rather, no cost for it. Like for example, let's say I have two server in North Virginia in two availability zone. I transfer data between them, I'm okay. No charge for that. The moment I transfer data out of the region to Mumbai region, I'll get charged for it. Or to a customer outside of Amazon, I will get charged for it. So you will get charged for outbound data transfer and this is the biggest thing to watch out for so yes a lot of company might not see five cents a big deal but five cents over billions of uh, trillions of traffic can be quite expensive can you guys hear me just to make sure I just want to make sure everybody's Okay, one second. Uh, can you hear me now? Someone, uh, I, got, I got muted by accidentally or someone by accidentally may have muted me. All right, perfect. So, 
you get this is the area where you need to pay a lot of attention so if you're a cloud practitioner you will be offering pricing to customers or uh, talking about talking to them or explaining them how they will be charged it's your job to explain this uh, stuff to them that you will get price you, you will get charged for outbound traffic not for inbound traffic now from inbound from amazon perspective not from your perspective you get charges for all these services depending what you get to use if you're if you're going to add a server is they're going to charge you for clock clockwise meaning every every second you get you get charged for so uh, you will incur charges while the server is running if the server is shut down you don't get charged for that so if your company after five o'clock does not use no no uh, customers outside after five o'clock everybody shut it down shut down all your services by five five thirty and then from seven thirty turn on all the servers again you don't get to you don't you don't get billed during the night shift this way you can save a lot of money you you can use cloud watch to monitor your instance but you will be charged for the there is no basic char, there is no charge for basic monitoring but the more detailed monitoring you will do you will be charged monthly a lump sum fee there is no charge for using auto scale why because if the auto scales add an instance you're going to be charged for the instance anyway so there is no charge for the service of using auto auto scaling elastic ip address is like a your own public ip address public ip there is no charge for public ip as long as it is a as it is associated with the instance <clears throat> but if you're not if you reserve an ip address but you're not using it you'll be paying a little bit of fee no you don't have to pay any any money or any charge for operating system if you want windows 2012 no charge for that if you want windows 2000 uh, 14 no charge for that amazon take cares of that so the price of the operating system is already built into instance pricing so but but if you want to install microsoft sql server on top of that you have to get your own license for microsoft sql server so all the applications that you use you must get that application license from the vendor that you're using Your charges can be based on durability, how reliability you want. Uh, if you want 11.9 durability versus, sorry, uh, 4.9 durability versus 3.9 durability, you'll get charged for that. So again, charges are a very, uh, uh, depending on various factor, not just the fact that you want a database and voila. You will get charges for using the database, type of features that you use, the data transfer, the amount of data that you're transferring, all those will be uh, will be taken into consideration. The cost of storage will be how many requests are sent to the storage. Remember, by on a free free tier, you get twenty thousand free, but then after that, you'll be billed for that. Uh, you will get tra charge for data transfer. 1 gig data transfer, 2 gig data transfer, 10 gig data transfer, something like this, similar to that. You'll get charged for H HDD versus SSD. So all those things in, it has to be considered when you're pricing it. So HDD is more expensive than, sorry, SDD more expensive than HDD. Okay. Your database factor will depend on how long the server is running, how big your database engine is going to be ssd correct sorry uh memory uh, whether you're paying for on-demand database uh, or paying up front uh, your storage all those will be considered when you are pricing your dat um, database uh, for that matter now amazon provides you with a calculator and i'll show you that in a minute cloud front which are price can be varied by based on region and number of requests and number of data transfer outbound so how many data being transferred to the to serve the client will be charged you will be paying for that 
Now, how do you know whether you're wasting money? Uh, Amazon has a service called Trusted Advisor. A trusted advisor which allows you to keep track of all the resources that you're using and it will give you an idea whether some of those resources are being wasted or not. So you can use a trusted advisor to kind of provide a best practice uh, which will look at your optimization, performance, security and fault tolerance. So it will give you an idea how much potential money you could be saving if you follow the guideline or if you follow the suggestion that it might provide. So some so far Amazon's uh, claim that they have provide, saved 500 plus million dollar uh, for users who are using the trusted advisor. But then again, that, that's just Amazon's he says, here says. Uh, a company uh, in India called Hangama, which uh, used the trusted advisor to be able, uh, and they were able to save 33% of their monthly expense and I believe they saved about $18,000 uh, pr approximately to be uh, uh, by using the service you have to understand sometimes what happen is some in some engineers who are not very thorough about this might end up creating instance more than one or two and they don't realize how much being charged for that see some of us technical guys we go beyond certain things that we don't look at the business side of it so we may provision more instance that we actually needed it. So this is why someone has to be looked uh, carefully on those design to ensure that uh, engineers don't recommend more than more instance or some of the instances are not being utilized or they choose the wrong database. All those uh, has to be looked into consideration. So you use the trusted advisor to help you uh, look into that. You can use the automate automation where trusted advisor can look at the cloud watch, uh, can send a trigger to the cloud watch, which will then ultimately remove certain instance or add instance or do whatever it's necessary to do to fix or save the uh, save money. So combination of all that, trusted advisor can send a notification saying, "Hey, you had you have a couple of instance that are causing problem." So take an action or I could take an action for you by adding more instance or removing those instance stuff like that. Uh, support Amazon follows following support structure, operational excellency, security, reliability, performance efficiency and cost efficiency. Uh, operational excellence where you look at to make sure that your design is proper so proper understanding about AWS will help you become more proficiency and efficient uh, uh, what do you call competency in, in, in terms of your Amazon uh, technologies make sure you design it properly make sure you document things properly any changes all those should, uh, stuff should be followed security make sure you have the proper security implement uh, in place uh, you're securing data, you're, secure, you're following the regulation of the countries, that you are prepared for an event. If something goes wrong, what action should, should, you, should you take should be taken into consideration. Reliability. Make sure your servers are distributed in a multiple zones, multiple uh, availability zones, that you have a test, if you have a recovery procedure. Even if you have a recovery procedure, you should test it on a regular basis. You know, keep training your employees, making sure they are up to date. All this should be into it would be taken into consideration. Performance: make sure you have a proper, uh, adequate bandwidth. Uh, experience, experienced people, experienced people. Uh, use serverless architecture whenever it's possible. All those needs to be considered when it comes to performances. Cost. Uh, make sure you choose a model that best suits you. Just because Amazon gives you pay, pay as you go doesn't mean uh, that you will save money by pay as you go. Sometime, for me, reserve is much better than the pay as you go model, for example. So make sure that you recommend the appropriate cost optimization for, for a client. Amazon support, proactive, uh, used account manager they have something called technical account manager who will give you access to a lot of the resources that you need 
So he, he or she will be the guy who will be your resp uh, responsible for talking to you. Best practice, use a trusted advisor. And of course, make sure you purchase Amazon support plan. They have a various different support plan, basic, developer, business, and enterprise. You can look at the Amazon website for further. Now, before I go into the uh, training side of it, I will show you the calculator. Uh, there are a couple of calculators are available from Amazon website. You can simply put uh, select whatever services that you want and Amazon will tell you how much it will cost you. So let's say if I want to use uh, an S3, which someone was talking about it, I want to use 100 GB, uh, sorry, 200 GB of data. It tells me it's going to cost me $4.85 per minute, per month just to use 400 GB. Then I have to, then if I select how much data being uh, transfer input output from different zone, the cost will increase. So if I transfer acceleration, I don't know, make say one gig per month, it only increased by 5.5 cents. Uh, data transfer is probably where you're gonna get a lot. So let's say data transfer out, I put 25 GB a month. $5. See, the more input you put in there, the better you're going to get, uh, uh, more idea you're going to get. I will share that uh, link to you so that you can use it for. Uh, where am I? Okay, so I'll share the link to you guys. And you can tr try it out. Okay, so those are some of the tools available. Now, if you are someone who are planning for uh, career in AWS, first of all, go to aws.com. They provide free training. Yes, you can do this free training from aws.amazon.com. Uh, it will walk you through how to set up, uh, uh, how to get a one year lab access from amazon.com. Go to the uh, certification uh, learning. Uh, create your own account and start practicing right away. Um, there are some tutorials available from Amazon.com. You can learn a lot of this and prepare for your certifications. Uh, today we, we talk about the uh, cloud certifications, which is practitioner, basically the basic fundamental about Amazon. From there, you can go to the solution architect path. You can go to developer path or you can go to sys, op, sys operating uh, administration path and some specialized specialization. Solution architect has two level, associate level and professional level, like a CCNA and CCNP. So you can go to this track if you want to. So this solution architect are someone who are responsible for designing and planning for um, MS, uh, AWS cloud. Sys op administration is system administration, day-to-day -day administration. If you're someone who's developer, then you, path, you choose the developer path. Uh, developer path will allow you to become uh, allows you to become a, a you know a, a soft development where you can learn uh, to write code uh, in Python or whatnot and become this engineer. If you have achieved the solution architect path as a professional level, then you can go into specialty. Specialties such as advanced networking, big data, do, uh, warehousing, and then of course you have security side of it. Okay, so these are the different paths that are available from Amazon. Um, now, some of you guys may have questions about uh, whether you'll get a job or not. Let's be honest about one thing. Nobody has a magic wand. I wish I had. I would be a if I had one, and I would be a millionaire today by giving you guys job. Uh, job is all about your own uh, preparation, your skills, the uh, how much you know, how much you can sell yourself. So that will help you find a better, better job. Now, obviously, if you're in Toronto, um, if you are a fresher, you will definitely need to get some hands-on experience. 
Uh, the best way to do that is by working with your local uh, city, uh, get a volunteer job, internship job, um, get you know work free for some schools, whatever is needed to get that per for first uh, hands-on experience. Uh, ultimately, you will get that job. So, but the key part about job is that you have to keep in mind. You're, it's not just about your hard skills. You also learn need to learn how to ta how to manage soft skills, communication, uh, how to sell yourself, how to prepare for interviews, all those stuff. I won't go into that details right now about that. But if you're in Toronto or if you do come to Toronto, feel free to get in touch with me. Um, I can be uh, reach in my office. I'll be glad to help you uh, fix your resumes or take a look at your resumes or whatnot and give you a little bit of guidelines in terms of finding a job. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of success stories in Toronto where we have taken people from um, zero to engineer. We have helped a nanny to become a Cisco engineer. We have helped uh, Uber driver to become a, a Cisco contact center engineer making 100,000. But that's not a magic uh, pills, to be honest with you. It's a lot of dedication, a lot of hard work that it needs to be done. I do a lot of career counseling among immigrants who are new and try to make them understand, look, I understand you might be the most highly qualified engineer in your country, but you are new in Canada. So you got to learn how to reset yourself. Uh, it goes with everybody. So don't uh, come with that expectation that just because you are uh, 10 years experience in uh, India, Saudi, that uh, the companies here will be merciful. Uh, but there is a way, there is a way out, there is a path, you just have to plan it properly. Uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, fo focus on further training, uh, these are the path that you may want to take. And if you want to get some hands-on training uh, in career, we have AWS classes starting this Saturday in Toronto. Um, we have classes in Thailand, Las Vegas, in Dubai. Uh, we have a 10-day course on AWS Associate and Professional. If you think that is something that you may want to look into it, take a look at our website under training, and then you will find AWS for that. Uh, we do have a weekend training for AWS in Toronto. There are, but then remember, guys, uh, some of you can get this training from AWS website for free of charge. I'm not here to I'm not here to just sell you guys what we do. The same training that uh, you can get a lot of theory done from AWS website. So what's the difference between us and that? That so we can provide you uh, a lot of uh, hands-on experience and gives you real data center experience by letting you work in our data center and migrate data to AWS as a kind of way to explain uh, getting ex hands-on experience onto that. But that's for another day. I hope you guys found this to be useful. Um, um, was uh, worth your time to spend. I do apologize for being a little longer today. And hopefully uh, you will use this information to better yourself and your career. Uh, I will send you guys this slide, the videos, as well as the lab guide um, today. So there will not be any session tomorrow. Uh, you, you, can, you can use this lab guide to practice that tomorrow morning or whatever. And get some uh, taste of what AWS is all about. And take it from there. And in the meantime... Please visit our website, voicebootcamp.com. I will send you guys a link. Uh, if you feel that my effort was uh, appreciated by and you found it to be useful, if you could give us a, a quick review on Google, um, I'll send you the link. All you have to do is go to that uh, Google uh, link and submit a few lines of what you think about my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great, wonderful day, everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at fcon at voicebootcamp.com and you will be able to get in touch with me.